Let us all pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we can hardly begin to imagine what a week would be like without a Sunday. Sometimes we have had to do without the opportunity of meeting with your people. We have been ill or taken away by duty, and we have missed it very much. To begin the week with a day when we don't seek to enjoy ourselves or even to enjoy others so much as to come and enjoy you and to glorify you forever. To begin a week like this is a lovely experience. We thank you for this beautiful morning, another gift of yours. But for your grace, the sun would not have risen this morning. But for your grace, we would neither have the health nor strength to come here. But for your grace, we would have no desire to worship in spirit and in truth. But for your grace, there could be no forgiveness of those sins which we have committed this last week, which could spoil our worship and make us spiritually dead and become a barrier between ourselves and your throne of grace. But you have made this day. This is the Lord's day. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is a wonderful day, a day of light, a day of hope, a day of peace, a day of quiet and rest, a day when we can turn our minds away from all the things that have occupied us during the week and have refreshment in a change of thinking so that when we go back tomorrow to our daily work, it will be with a fresh spirit, with a mind that has been restored with a soul that is quickened and made more alive. We pray now that as we continue to think about the Holy Spirit, that he may make himself obvious to us, that we may understand the truth and that the truth may set us free. And what we pray for ourselves, we pray for every one of your people, wherever they are gathered at this moment. And we ask it in and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you have a Bible, you might like to turn with me to the first book of Samuel, chapter 9, verse 27. The first book of Samuel, chapter 9, verse 27, reading through to part of chapter 10. The story is that Saul has been sent to look for some asses lost by his father. And on the way, he bumps into Samuel, the prophet, who gives him an extraordinary message, namely that he is to be the first king of Israel. And Saul is going on looking for the asses. Verse 27, as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us. And when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord appointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their enemies round about. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say to you, The asses which you went to seek are found, and now your father has ceased to care about the asses and is anxious about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on from there further and come to the oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there, <clears throat> one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. After that you shall come to Gibeath Elohim, 
where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as you come to the city, you will meet a band of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them, prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come mightily upon you, and you shall prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. And you shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a band of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came mightily upon them, upon him, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him before saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Saul's uncle said to him and to his servants, Where did you go? And he said to seek the asses. And when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Pray, Tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the asses had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom, of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. Well, now I've decided to postpone the second half of last Sunday morning's sermon, and we'll pick it up at a later stage. I want to start this morning doing what I promised you I would do, going right through the Bible, looking at everything the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. And therefore, this morning, I want to speak about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. There isn't nearly as much about him as in the New, but there's a great deal. And I'm going to give you a text. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come mightily upon you, and you will be turned into another man. You will be turned into another man. And this is the theme of the whole of the Old Testament in relation to the Holy Spirit. That the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon a man turns him into another man. Another kind of character. Another person. Able to do things that he was never able to do before. Now, one of the lies of the devil, which I'm constantly coming up against, is this. You can't change human nature. Humanly speaking, that's true. Though now we have entered the age of brainwashing, when scientists have discovered that certain psychological manipulation of the human being can, in fact, change their character, that drugs can change their character, that electrical shock can change their character. And so we live in a day when people are not saying quite so frequently, you can't change human nature. But every one of these modern ways of brainwashing a man, changing his outlook, changing his character, leaves him less of a person than he was before and makes him more of a machine. I think we've seen some of the results of the techniques of brainwashing used behind the Iron Curtain over the last 20 years. And you feel that it has destroyed a man. He is not a human being now. He's a machine. He's a Pavlovian dog making the right kind of responses to the right stimulus. But he's not another man. He's become something less than a man. There is only one power in the whole universe that can take a man and turn him into another man and make him more of a man than he was before and not less. 
make him more of a human being, more of a personality. And that's the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm impressed with the fact in the New Testament that when the people of Pentecost were filled with the Holy Ghost, they didn't become automatons, they didn't become robots, they didn't become mechanical people. They became more intensely themselves than they ever were before. They became more uh, attractive characters. They became greater personalities in their own right. And in the rest of the New Testament, the personalities of John and Peter and Paul are still so different from each other, even more different. And yet somehow they are new people. Somehow they've been turned into another man. Well, now, this is the theme for this morning. All the way through the Old Testament, we read this kind of phrase, the Holy Spirit came on someone. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon someone. The Holy Spirit filled someone. And the immediate result was they became another man or another woman. There are one or two women who are filled with the Spirit in the Old Testament, mostly men. Well, now, before I come to that, may I start with the very first page of the Bible, the Holy Spirit's mentioned right from the beginning. Do you realize that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit worked together to make the world in which we live? They were all three involved. They are all there in chapter 1 of Genesis. Without Christ was not anything made that has been made, Christ made the stars and the trees with his Father. Sometimes my boy and I get together and we get balsa wood and balsa cement or something else or a plastic model aircraft kit and father and son together work at it. Of course, it's a chore to me, as you'll realize, uh, just as playing with trains is an awful chore to grown-up men and to fathers. Um, I have a photograph at home uh, taken of my sixth birthday and it shows my father and his friend a bank manager down on the floor putting my train together for me on my sixth birthday and of course it was very kind of them to go out of their way to do this <laughs> but it's lovely when father and son can work together on something and make something together there's a companionship between them that's creative and Father and Son together created the world. Without Christ was not anything made that has been made. But the further truth I now want to bring to you is that Father and Son worked with the Spirit. The three of them were all working together to create this wonderful universe which science is now exploring. And so we have in almost the second verse, we have in the second verse itself, that the Spirit of God was brooding over the waters. Now, why does it tell us this? Because it wants us to know from the very beginning that when the Holy Spirit operates, order comes out of chaos. And anything that goes in the reverse direction is not of the Holy Spirit. God is a God of order, not of confusion. And when the Holy Spirit comes on chaos, he produces order out of it. He doesn't produce more chaos. And so over the formless and chaotic something that God the Father had made, the Spirit was brooding. The literal Hebrew word is hovering. You've seen a hawk hovering in the sky, almost motionless, watching the things that are happening below. That's the verb used here. And from the very beginning, we are almost told to think of the Holy Spirit as a bird hovering above, watching what is happening. That's a picture that pops up again in John's Gospel, where when Jesus was baptized, as he stood up in the water afterwards praying, the Holy Spirit hovered over him. And the order of our Lord's life was due to the Holy Spirit bringing God's order. And you get the impression from our Lord's life that he was never hurried. He never had too much to do. He was always busy. He had an ordered life that was able to do all that God wanted him to do. The Holy Spirit hovered over Jesus at his baptism 
as at the first day of creation, the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. Now let me apply that even more directly. If the Holy Spirit comes in power on a church, the result will be order, not chaos. The result will not be the kind of noise that is purposeless, the kind of activity that is disturbing and chaotic. The result of the Holy Spirit's coming will be to bring God's order into that church. Now it may disturb the order that's already there because that order may be a human order that is not of God. But it will not be chaos. It will build up, not destroy. And when the Holy Spirit really operates, there is an order and a decency that is of God. It's one of the tests of the power of the Holy Spirit. Does this bring order or chaos? The Holy Spirit brooding. Then in chapter 2 of Genesis, you have God breathing, and the words spirit and breath are the same. God spiriting a corpse. God breathing into a corpse. God giving the kiss of life to Adam. So all that I said last week pops up again. Vitality, life, power is there. But purity is also allied to the vitality. Order is allied to the life. And where the Holy Spirit comes, he gives life and order. I remember as a biological student, I had to learn all the Latin names of the families of insects. I can think of few things more boring than trying to learn the Latin names of the various species of flies and spiders and beetles and things. But it was part of our course and we had to go through it. But what struck me immensely was the order of it all. I know that man has produced the Latin words, but it was God who put the order there in the first place. Or man could never label it like this. Man can only analyze what God has ordered. And it strikes me now that as I learned those Latin names, I was learning the order of the Spirit of God brooding over the chaos and producing after their kinds those creatures which God had ordained. Well, now so much for the beginning of the Bible, but now let me take a sweep of the whole Old Testament. Supposing I gave you a little bit of homework to do. Supposing I said, here's a piece of paper, or here's the back of your bulletin with nothing on the back, so you can do it this morning. Here's the back of your bulletin. Get a pencil out. I want you to write down the names of all the great people of the Old Testament, as many as you can remember. I think you'd probably get up to about 30 or 40 if you tried hard and you know your Bibles at all well. You'd be able to write down Abraham and Moses and Joshua and Gideon. I've got a little list here and Samson and Saul and David and Solomon and all the rest. Do you know that if you checked up you would find that there is a statement about every single name that you've written that connects that person with the Holy Spirit? It's one of the most astonishing discoveries, and I didn't make it till I went through and looked at each of these men, that every great man in the Old Testament owed it to the Holy Spirit, not to anything or anyone else, that this is what made those men what they were. Now, having made a list of heroes, I then divided them into three groups. Those who were great because of something they did, those who were great because of something they said, and those who were great because of something they were. Here are the three forms of human greatness. And if anybody ever says about you, you're great, except in the modern colloquial sense, but if anybody says of you, you're a great person, then they will mean one of these three things, that you did something great, that you said something great, or that you were something great. Alas, the word great has now been devalued in modern language, and my children use it for almost anything they enjoy. It's great, Daddy. <laughs> but the word great means something unusual, out of the ordinary, exceptional. Now, these great men take, first of all, those who are great because of something they did, some great achievement which put them in the front rank of leadership, and the names I have mentioned would cover people who did great things. 
How did they get that greatness? Heredity? Environment? Education? This is how people get great things today. You have to be born great or you have to have some greatness thrust upon you. But it will either come from your heredity and you inherit a high IQ or certain physical and mental qualities which will make you great. Or you have to have the kind of education and training and environment and experience which will enable you to do great things. Somebody has recently done a thesis on human greatness and they have discovered that greatness comes either in the earliest years of life, before 30, or it comes after 50. So I'm sorry to disappoint those of you who are in between the two. It's unlikely that you're great. But genius, real greatness, comes early or late. And many of the great geniuses of the world were famous long before they were 30. Or else they had a long unknown period and then flowered late in life. But they're speaking of genius that is hereditary or environment. They're speaking of greatness that came from some earthly factor. But when I study the great men of the Old Testament, there is no indication whatever either of hereditary greatness or environmental factors. When I look at my bunch of heroes, I find they were desperately ordinary people with neither a great classical breeding in their family tree, nor an educational system that could produce them. How then were they able to do the amazing things? The answer is, the Holy Spirit turned them into other men at some point in their history. Now, I remember taking a group of children once in a Sunday school anniversary, and I asked the children... Hands up those who think they know the strongest, the name of the strongest man in the Bible. Every hand shut up. And there, so I asked a few, Samson, of course. And I said, wrong. And they looked quite shattered. And I'm sure a psychologist would tell me I was quite wrong to take this approach, that you shouldn't, I probably set up repressions and inhibitions in I don't know how many Sunday school children. But I said, no, he wasn't. So I said, now, how many of you think you know the name of the wisest man in the Bible? Again, all the hands shut up. All right, who is it? Solomon. No, I said, that's wrong too. And they looked even more crestfallen. They began to look in pity at the preacher as much as to say, you know, this chap just doesn't know anything. We've heard all this for years. It was very interesting to see the adults in the congregation looking a bit puzzled. You see, according to my Bible, Samson was terribly weak by nature, by heredity, by physique. He was terribly weak. Only when the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him could he deal those Philistines a mortal blow with the jawbone of an ass or carry the city gates 30 miles. Only when the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him was he strong. And Samson's mistake was to come to a point where he thought he was strong. And he said, I will go out as at other times and deal with this, these Philistines. But he did not realize that the Lord had departed from him so they could tie him up with string. He was as weak as a kitten by nature. But when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he could do mighty things. Now that's a case of physical strength. Let me take another case. Now people vary in whether they're useful with their hands. Some husbands can really be useful around the house. They can paper a ceiling. And that's quite an achievement. They can knock a nail in straight. They can do oh so many things. I can pick out from looking at you now which of you can, looking at your wives' faces. Well now, some husbands are just hopeless. If they knock a nail in, you'll have to get the plaster in to put the wall right. <laughs> and some of us just cannot do these things. Now, there is a man mentioned in the Old Testament who couldn't do practical things. He couldn't work with his hands. His name is Bezalel. And this man, I'm sorry, let me get it right. Yes, Bezalel, isn't it? I thought it was Bezalel for a moment. Bezalel. 
Now, Bezalel was a man who couldn't knock a nail in straight. He was a man who didn't have the gifts. And yet, God called this man to be one of the craftsmen to put up the tabernacle, which was a 300,000 pound project, and was going to be absolutely perfect and must be of the very best for God. And it says quite simply that the Holy Spirit came upon Bezalel, he was turned into a master craftsman, and he had gifts then which he had never had before to work metal and wood and stone. Well, now, this is what happened to him. Let's take one or two others. There are not only physical achievements, there are mental achievements. Have you ever heard about a man praying in his sleep? I don't know if you've ever prayed in your sleep. I think from time to time most Christians do this. If they pray when they're awake, sometimes in their sleep they'll find themselves praying. And one of the greatest prayers in the Old Testament was prayed by a man in his sleep. And this man was a king, and this man prayed for mental wisdom. The king was Solomon. And he said, Lord, I need wisdom. If I'm going to rule this nation, I'm not clever enough. He knew perfectly well he was a silly man. And by nature, he was foolish. He was one of the most foolish men in the Old Testament. To have 300 wives and 700 concubines is not a wise act. It's a triumph of hope over experience, but it's a foolish thing to do, and in fact, it ruins Solomon's reign. But Solomon prayed for wisdom. He knew he was a silly man, and he prayed for wisdom from God, and, and God said, I'll give that to you because you didn't ask for money or health or anything that other people would ask for. You asked for wisdom, I'll give it to you. And the Spirit of God brought wisdom to Solomon. And he woke up the next morning and he found it was just a dream and that he dreamt the whole thing. And he thought, D was it real? Did it happen? And into his palace that day came two women, both claiming the same baby. They'd been living together. They'd each had a baby. One had died and this one said it was the other's baby who died, and this one said it was this one's baby who died. And wisdom was, was greatly needed by a man trying to cope with two women angry with each other. And Solomon gave the wisest answer that could have been given. He said, cut the baby in half and give half to her, half to her. And immediately, the one who was not the real mother said, that's fine by me, but the real mother would rather have her baby alive in someone else's hands and said, all right, let her have the baby. And Solomon knew. Now he'd got the answer. And he realized that even though the prayer had been in a dream, he'd asked for the spirit of wisdom and the Holy Spirit gave him wisdom. And while the Holy Spirit was on him, he could produce the book of Proverbs, he could take the wisest decisions. But like Samson before him, when Solomon stopped trusting the wisdom of the spirit, and was without the Spirit, chaos resulted. Well, now that's the first group of heroes in the Old Testament, those who had great achievements, who did great things. Now I come to the second group, those who were great because they said great things. Now I want to come to a word that we've got to understand if we're going to see this, the word prophecy, or the word prophet, which is a man who prophesies. Now, I am not a prophet. I'm a preacher. I'm not a prophet. And preaching is not prophecy, and we must realize this. It's quite a different gift. Preaching is essentially the fruit of a man's mind meditating on God's word and explaining it and expounding it to people. But prophecy is not that at all. Prophecy is when a man's mind is not thinking, but when God's mind is using his mouth for an immediate, direct, inspired utterance from God for his people. Now, that's the gift of prophecy. It's not preaching. Isaiah, for example, didn't sit down and have a good think about the political situation and then preach a sermon about it. Isaiah opened his mouth and the mind of God used it. 
This is something that is written right through Scripture. There is one phrase of five words, four words, that occurs 3,808 times in the Old Testament alone. Now, I haven't checked this up again, but you can when you get home. 3,808 times, these are the words, Thus saith the Lord. And that phrase comes again and again and again. And wherever it comes, it is not a man preaching, it is a man prophesying. It is a man who has the supernatural power to open his mouth and speak directly from the mind of God. And it happens all the way through the Old Testament. Now if I start making a list of the prophets, Amos, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, and then through to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Habakkuk and Zephaniah and Haggai and Zechariah, the lot. If you look at these men, there is a statement about each of them that they said what they did because the Holy Spirit gave them the power to do so. That without the Holy Spirit, they could never have said it. They wouldn't have known what to say. And there is even a statement in the Bible that they didn't understand what they said. And that's a statement of Simon Peter in the New Testament, that they said things about the future which they didn't understand, and they talked with each other about what they had said. This is prophecy. Now it starts way back in the Old Testament. Abraham is said to be a prophet. Moses is described as a prophet. He was a great leader, but he was also a prophet. How do you think we got the Ten Commandments and the law of God from Moses? Did he sit down and think up a new ethical system? Did he consult the professor of advanced legal studies in, in the court of Hammurabi, or what did he do? No, he prophesied, and the words came from the mind of God. You go right through the Bible and you find that every prophet had this gift of his vocal cords being completely available to God's mind. And one of the most extraordinary stories in the Old Testament about the Spirit of God is how the Spirit of God enabled a donkey to speak. Rational, intelligible words. Now a donkey has vocal cords. If you've ever had an ass in a field behind your back garden, you'll know that. And God can control a donkey's or an ass's vocal cords just as easily as he can control the vocal cords of a man to produce intelligible speech. And unless we see that the Spirit of God has this power of control, the story of Balaam's ass will be a complete mystery to you. But it's there. And the same Spirit who is able to make an Isaiah, a Jeremiah, and an Ezekiel speak the words of God can make Balaam's ass speak words too. Now that stretches your faith. But then there was a very interesting uh, little thing on the schools program recently. Not that I spend my days watching school programs, but there was just one I saw recently and a sound thing that my children wanted me to see because they'd uh, been talking about it. And a man took a jar and he covered the top of it with uh, a sheet of rubber, held it tight, cut a little slit in the rubber, and then had a plunger that went up and down inside and by manipulating this and pumping air through it, all mechanically, he was able to make it say very clearly, like a little baby, Mama, Mama. And he was demonstrating that all it needs is someone who can manipulate the vocal cords to make it say whatever it wants. And he could make this machine very simply, so simply that a child could make it a talking machine. Well, I'm saying that God, the Holy Spirit, brooding over nature, can do the same thing. And the prophets are precisely what is happening. Now, this enabled them to do two things. First of all, to make a completely accurate diagnosis of the present. And secondly, to make a completely accurate forecast of the future. These are two things that are completely beyond the mind of men. We can make some kind of diagnosis of the present. We can make some kind of guess about the future. 
but only the mind of God can tell us exactly what is going wrong in the present and exactly what will happen in the future. And the prophets were men who could do both. Here is a statement of the prophet Micah. Let him speak for them all. I truly am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord, and I declare to Israel his sin. Incidentally, it's interesting that the Holy Spirit usually sent a prophet when things were going wrong. That's why they're always prophets of doom. And though they have hope for the future, they were always critical of the present, and this made them very unpopular, and it was why Jesus stoned the prophets. I remember a dear old preacher saying to me he was a very simple man, a man who'd had no education to speak of, a man who'd spent his days working with his hands. But he was a, a great preacher. And I once asked him about his preaching, and I said, uh, how did you start preaching? And I remember him saying this. He said, well, you know, if God could use Balaam's ass to speak intelligibly, he could use me. So he said, I just let him. And that was a very interesting little saying. If God could make an ass speak for him, he could use me, so I just let him. This is what I'm saying. Every single person in this church could do something great for God, could say something great for God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, even if you've no natural <coughs> gifts, even if your heredity is all awry, even if your environment hasn't given you a chance, everybody could do this. For the Holy Ghost is no respecter of persons, and can use anybody who's willing. Now I come to my third group of heroes, those who were great because of what they were. I think, I suppose, that this is the greatest greatness of all. We may be remembered for great things we've done, for great things we've said, but oh, to be remembered for great things we were. In a little chapel in Cumberland that I once visited, the wall is plastered with marble slabs you can read the history of the church on them, you know, so-and-so was this, that, and the other, and each slab had a long essay uh, all about the person, every mortal thing they'd done. And I walked around this church, and these great big tributes all around the walls of bygone worthies, and I came to a tiny little one right at the end of the village schoolmaster, and instead of a long, wordy essay about his achievements and contributions, there were just three words, kind and good. And in a sense, looking at all the others, all the others were about what people did. This was about what he was. And I felt I'd come to the greatest stone of all. Now, this is how we remember real greatness, people for what they were, not just what they said and did. Now, who were the greatest people in the Old Testament? Well, I'll tell you one of them straight away. King David was surely a man after God's own heart. He's described as that. And the thing that strikes me most about David is not what he did, though he enlarged the borders of Israel more than any other king. Not so much what he said, though he said some very wonderful things, and we've got the book of Psalms. But from his life, I get the impression the greatest thing about David was what he was. And the junior department of our Sunday school this morning are studying David's magnanimous attitude to Saul when Saul tried to kill him. How he forgave his enemies, a great man. Now what was David's secret? You discover the secret when David went wrong and got into trouble. You remember the incident? He saw Bathsheba bathing. He broke four of the Ten Commandments in one fell swoop. He coveted his neighbor's wife. He arranged to murder Uriah, um, sorry, I forget who it was, his uh, Bathsheba's husband in battle, so he killed. He stole his wife. He committed adultery. All four commandments he broke in one fell swoop. And the prophet of God came to David and said, you've done wrong. And David realized that he had forfeited the one thing that made him what he was. And he got on his knees and he prayed a prayer for forgiveness, a prayer that we're going to use this morning in worship. And he said, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I know I don't deserve to have a Holy Spirit living in my life now. 
I don't deserve to have this power to be a saint now. I've forfeited the right, but I plead with you, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Forgive me, put me back. I've sinned, I've sinned very deeply, and I realize that you could now take from me the only power that makes me what I am. It's a wonderful prayer. There are many other people. Joseph is a man in, uh, that we could look at. Do you know that Joseph is the only man in the whole Old Testament of whom not a single fault is ever recorded? Unless you count his telling his dreams to his brothers, a bit of pride, I don't think it was. I think he was quite surprised by their reaction to it. But when you read the story of Joseph, there is not a single fault in his character recorded. There must have been faults, but they are not recorded for us. Do you want to know Joseph's secret of how in a foreign land, when enticed by Potiphar's wife, he could resist, even though no one would know about it? Do you want to know of how he could be thrown into prison unjustly and still be kind to the prisoners? Do you want to know what was the secret of a man who could be so cruelly dealt with by his own brothers and then forgive them and give them food? Do you want to know the secret? Here's the secret. It's in Genesis 41, and it states this. Joseph was a man in whom the Spirit of God was. There's the secret. Now, do you see where all this is heading? I think this is lovely. All the great people of the Bible are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. People just like us, without great advantages, and they're doing extraordinary things. They are doing the work of God by the Spirit of God. They are being turned into other people, and therefore they no longer are limited to natural gifts. They have supernatural gifts as well. I pray for the day when every one of us in this church will realize that every one of us could do anything by the Spirit of God. And stop saying, I could never do that. I could never do this. This is beyond me. Humanly speaking, it is. Divinely speaking, it's within your capacity because it's within the power of the Holy Ghost. The Old Testament, and this finishes off my study for this morning, closes by looking forward to two dreams. Dreams revealed by the prophets. Two hopes for the future concerning the Holy Spirit, and here they are. One, that one day there will come a king like David, a son of David, who will be perfectly filled with the Holy Spirit and be able to do anything and to say anything and to be anything. The hope is called the hope of the Messiah. And the word Messiah means anointed one. And throughout the Old Testament, oil is used as a symbol of the Holy Ghost. And every king was anointed with oil as a visible prayer that God would pour out the Holy Spirit upon them. And the word Messiah means anointed one, as in the Greek language the word Christ means anointed one. As in the coronation service of Queen Elizabeth II, oil was put on her forehead and it was called the chrism. The chrism. It was a prayer that she might be anointed with the Holy Ghost. And the Old Testament looks forward to a day when there will come a king who is just anointed with the Holy Ghost and power and is able to be perfect and to perform any miracle and to speak anything of the mind of God. They had never had someone quite so full as that. And so they looked forward to the coming King, the Messiah, the Christ, the Chrism, the anointed King, full of the Holy Ghost. That was one hope they had. They waited a thousand years for that dream to be fulfilled. And when the babe was born at Bethlehem, the dream came true. The other dream they had was this. One day, Moses had been prophesying. And one of his right-hand men came to him and said, There are two people, Eldad and Medad, over the other side of the camp prophesying, rivals to you. And Moses wasn't jealous a bit. He said, would 
God that all the Lord's people were prophets, that everybody could be used to speak the mind of God. And this dream began as a seed then, and it grew and it grew. Isaiah expresses it, Ezekiel expresses it, and Joel expressed it more fully than anyone else. And finally Joel said, it's not just a dream, it's going to happen. It will come to pass in the last days that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Your maidservants and your men servants. In other words, that is saying those who would never be great will be great by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think of Gladys Aylward, a London parlour maid filled with the Spirit, becoming a great pioneer in China. I think of a cobbler in Northampton becoming the father of the modern missionary movement, William Carey. And I say, if God can do it for them, can do it for me. And the day of Pentecost was the day that this dream came true. And everybody there, no matter what their intelligence quotient, no matter what their heredity, what their environment, what their education, these were ignorant and unlearned men, Galileans. And listen, they're speaking the mighty works of God. How? The Holy Spirit had been poured out upon them. So that's what the Old Testament says about the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament says it doesn't matter who you are, how ordinary you are, how few gifts you have, if any, by nature. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you can be turned into another person. You can exercise new gifts and not just dedicate the ones you have by nature. You can become an extraordinary person. You can be great for God. That's the promise which is to you and to your children and to all that are afar off, to as many as the Lord our God shall call to him. Let us sing a hymn.